KPFT Houston. Lee Foster is a prisoner. If Texas has its way, he'll be dead by the end of the hour. This is Execution Watch. Huntsville, Texas, death penalty capital of the Western world, where final preparations are underway to execute Foster by giving him a deliberate drug overdose. During the next hour, KPFT's Execution Watch will broadcast live coverage and commentary on the killing in Texas the state responsible for more than a third of all U.S. executions in the modern era. Execution Watch host Ray Hill, legal analyst Jim Skelton, with criminal defense attorneys Susan Ashley and Larry Douglas, Huntsville reporter outside the death house Gloria Rubeck, Houston Vigil reporter Nancy Bailey. Our featured interview tonight was pre-recorded. At the request of Plea Foster, Execution Watch taped an interview with him on death row. We'll air that interview tonight for the first time. The Execution Watch begins. My name is Ray Hill. This is Execution Watch. I've got the full crew in here tonight. We're going to do a show, but I'm going to begin with a personal note. When Texas executed uh, my, my old and dear friend, uh, Billy Hughes. I said that I wasn't going to get close to people on death row anymore because I'm just not constitutionally wired to handle the loss of friends by this act of the state. Well, I lied. I went back and I interviewed Stephen Woods and Cleve Foster, both on one day. And then I went back and interviewed Cleve Foster again. Sarge, I like Sarge. I let myself care about Sarge and his life and on death row and otherwise. Personal note, I will keep on doing this. I have to suffer the pain of doing this, but I don't like it. Lori, you're on the air. Uh, hi. Uh, well, the media has just walked in. I just challenged them to re- that they were going to be watching the execution of an innocent man. Oh, my God. And here comes Sarge's mom, his sister, his son, and somebody in a wheelchair. I'm not sure who that is. Um, Well, the Supreme, it's interesting. Just one second, Ray. To To the sister family, we're out here with you. We're standing with you. We're sending our thoughts and prayers and our love as the state of Texas prepares the premeditated murder. We love you all. Um, Ray? Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> I know this is rough on both of us, uh, Gloria, because Sarge wasn't just another name on the list. He was a friend. And you know his family. I just, yeah, uh, whoops, I was over at the hospitality house with them talking to him on the phone when we found out the Supreme Court had turned him down. And it's interesting that um, it was a 9-6 ruling. You know who the three dissenters were? Who? All of the women on the Supreme Court. So we told Sarge, he's got something going because he got all the women. (laughs) Okay, Gloria. Keep us informed of what's going on. Uh, Okay, I just want to say that Sarge had a message for for you and the people that do the prison show and Execution Watch and for David Babb. He he said to tell everybody hello and thank everybody for their support. And he said to tell the guys that he left on the row to never give up, to keep fighting and fighting and fighting to your last breath. And if you want to, if you want to, Gloria is not only a reporter here on Execution Watch, but she is also a fine activist that I've known for a good many years. She and I have held up the higher end of many a a picket line. And uh, uh, you can follow her organizational connection by going to abolitionmovement.com. 
dot o r g. That's abolition movement dot o r g. And Gloria, keep us informed. Okay, and uh, Sarge's uh, family will want to talk when this is over tonight. Well, the way because it's taking longer for the process to complete. Oh yeah. We're going to play Sarge's interview probably before we get your final word. Okay. 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 But but if there's any indication of something different, let us know. Okay, I will. All right. Thank you. That was right. Gloria Ruback of the Texas Death Penalty Abolition Movement, and you can find out more about her by going to www.abolitionmovement.org. Is that Nancy? Yes. Nancy? Nancy, you're on the air. Nope. I Sorry, we lost Nancy. Nancy Bailey is actually in Houston, and she is uh, doing a vigil here. Gloria is in Austin out in front of the death uh, house itself, and there is, of course, a, um, a demonstration uh, opposed to capital punishment there, or and sometimes it's there are demonstrators there in favor of capital punishment. Uh, we're running a little ahead of schedule, so we're going to see if they can get Nancy on the phone. Nancy? Yes, I'm here. Where are you, darling? I'm in front of the Episcopal Church on Woodhead in Alabama, West Alabama. Okay. How many folks you got there? Uh, we got eight right now. Okay. And the passerby know what you're there about? Yes, we've got some good honks and some thumbs up and some waves. So it's all been good and positive today. Well, Nancy is uh, involved with WWW. TCADP.org, that is the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. And in addition to that organization, they have kind of umbrella meetings for folks that are interested in the issue. And you can get in touch with them in, uh, at www.tcadp.org. Nancy, your feelings tonight? My feelings? Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, hard to say, but it, we're always sad to be here for the purpose of an execution, but we're uh, feeling good that the public opinion seems to be changing and that we are uh, receive positive feedback rather than negative feedback. Well, uh, I understand from discussion with the rest of the crew here that this is not Sarge's first date. Actually, he has had four previous dates, and yes. uh, they're proceeding on the fifth one. And uh, um, I have a lot of feelings about what he has gone through in the struggle. Yeah, that is really, really a rough kind of a prelude to ultimately being killed. Well, Nancy, give my regards to the other vigilants. I certainly will, and it's good to hear from you, and I appreciate all the good work y'all are doing. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. And that was Nancy Bailey and Gloria Rubeck, who are covering uh, from the scene. Uh, go to Jim. Yeah. Okay. Let me tell you what this case is about, Ray. As you well know by the name of Sarge, if he'd been in the military, he'd be what we'd call a lifer. He was one of those guys that loved the military. And he ended up in recruiting, and that tells you he's kind of one of these big, burly guys is real friendly. He wouldn't have been in a recruiting office. Well, one of the people that he tried to recruit when he was a recruiter was a guy named Sheldon Ward. Sarge got in a little bit of trouble in the military. He was providing some booze to some of the underage kids and also, I think, had sex with one of them. And they were going to court-martial him, so he did not re-enlist. After he gets out of the military, he and Ward team up, and they're living in El Paso in a hotel. And one of the things they did in the evenings, they were going over to a bar called Fat Ernie's. And they've been over there a lot. They were kind of regular customers there. Another regular customer was a lady by the name of, they call her Mary. She was a refugee from Sudan. And Mary's last name was Pal. And she'd also been at the bar some, too, so they all knew each other. Well, during the evening, according to the testimony, Sarge was playing pool, and his Sheldon Ward, his friend, and he and Mary kind of paired up, and they were pretty well making out. They were doing what they called dirty dancing and being real flirtatious, spent the whole evening together. So when the bar closed at 2 o'clock, the bartender saw Mary Powell get in her car and leave, and she saw Sarge get in his pickup with Sheldon Ward with him, and they followed the car. And the only thing they thought was unusual, they were pretty close behind 
Mary's car. And then the next morning at about 10 o'clock, they found Mary's body out in the wooded area and she had been shot in the head. And what had happened uh, at that point, they didn't know he actually held her identity because she was nude. And how they broke the case was real simple. After Sarge and Sheldon Ward go back to the motel, uh, Ward gets kind of panicky, I suppose. He calls up a good friend of his named Dwayne Thomas and asks Dwayne to come and pick him up, so I'm going to move out. And Dwayne said, what's the deal? And so Sarge gets, gets in the car with Dwayne, and he, and he tells Dwayne, well, last night I kidnapped a woman at gunpoint, raped her, took her out in the woods, and shot and killed her. And this just scared the dickens out of, out of Thomas, so he stops and calls 911, and that's how the police broke the case. And from that, so it led to So all of this to, happened, like, within 24, 48 oh yeah. hours. Oh, yeah. They found the body at 10 o'clock the next morning. Last one to see Mary alive was around 2 o'clock in the morning. Bodies found at 10 the next morning. Uh, when That morning, when Ward calls his best friend, one of his good friends to come to get him, he tells about the murder. They call 911. That leads to the motel, leads to picking up charge, and that leads pretty much to the case. So the only people that actually know what happened from the time they left the bar until the next morning was Sarge and his buddy. Yeah. Why is the most puzzling thing of the case, the way that bothers me most about this case than anything, is in order for to make this a captain murder case, they had to prove it was a murder during the course of a rape or kidnapping. And the only evidence that came out of any sort of rape, or we now call it aggravated sexual assault, the only evidence came from the mouth of Ward, and that came when he told his friend Dwayne. And when Dwayne, and I never have figured out yet, because I've read everything I could find, how in the world that got into evidence, because that's a statement made by a co-defendant. And uh, the only evidence at all, there was nothing confirming, corroborating the story that this woman had been kidnapped. Nobody else saw a gun. Nobody else saw her abducted. In fact, all the evidence is the contrary because they were all friendly that evening. They were mugging it up and smooching at the bar. And there'd be no reason, I would think, they'd want to kidnap her. And the only evidence of a rape, as opposed to consensual sex, came from the mouth of Ward himself. Now, what they were able to prove later through DNA evidence, that the sperm of Ward was found in the anus of Mary, and the sperm of Sarge was found in her vagina. There was sex between all three of them. But that's a long way from proving aggravated sexual assault and a long way from proving kidnapping. Didn't Ward have a brain tumor somewhere? Well, he died of cancer. I think Susan's going to talk about that. He died of cancer at, at before he was he give us given the death penalty too, but had died of cancer in TDC before they executed him. Well, something unscheduled has happened. Uh, Darcy Gordon has called in. She's uh, Sarge's fiance for ten years. Uh, uh, Darcy, you're on the air. Well, I just wanted to tell Cleve I love him and. Cleve okay. cannot hear you. He's in the death chamber. Who can hear you are the people who are listening to Execution Watch. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Well, his family knows me, and I tried to call the court, and they didn't do anything about it. Okay. Well, we certainly uh, am sorry to hear uh, uh, of what you're going through as well as what Sarge is going through. If you can hear the show, we will be playing an interview with Sarge in a few minutes. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I just don't know what to do about these unscheduled telephone calls. It's, it's, it's awkward radio. Uh, I wish I knew about these things in advance. Uh, because I'm, I'm very interested in the story you tell. Uh, Susan, what about that tumor? What What's the deal on the tumor? You know, it, of course, it makes you wonder naturally. It, it, typically, okay, what you seem to have here is you have a female that was willing to, uh, shall we say, on a friendly basis with Ward, perhaps, you know, willing to have sex with him, and we know that she ended up dead. Okay, it appears clearly... She was shot with Ward's gun. It, you know, it's obvious. Yeah, Ward she, said he she, killed she, her. She, that was really a gun bought by Cleve Foster at a hawk shop. And they both of them had it. It was a gun that he bought. 
So is a okay. gun or both of them? That's, yeah. I don't well, Cle- correct about that. Foster said it was Ward's gun. Her tissue and blood was on the gun. Right. So, so we know she was shot with that gun. And that was the same gun that another female had been shot with. So it, it is kind of unusual. Uh, you know, I mean, it would seem that Mary was willing to have sex with him, and it didn't really seem any reason to kill her afterwards. I mean, it wasn't like a case where he was attacking her to have sex with him and to rape her and then kill her. It was more likely that she had consensual sex with him, and then she was killed. I, um, I, I, we keep getting telephone calls in uh, of people that want to get involved in the show that we had no way of knowing they are going to call in. And so what I think we're going to do at this point is I think we're going to play the interview with Sarge, and um, it's self-explanatory. July 25th, 2012. My name is Ray Hill. I'm talking with Sarge Foster about a pending date uh, in about a month and a few days. Right. Sarge, you know what this interview is about. Yes, I do. And... Uh, We hope we don't get to play this. We really do. Me and Elizabeth don't want to play this interview, but just in case, you have asked to be interviewed on your own Execution Watch show. Yes. And you know what that show's about. You've heard it. Yes, I have. So after they get through with that procedure in Huntsville, we will play this tape of your voice. Right. What do you want those people that have just witnessed that on the radio to know? Well, if they do witness this, one of the first things I want them to know is they just killed an innocent man. I did not do this crime, and I'll fight it till the end. And I want my mother and everyone there to know that uh, I love them, that I'm all right. Sarge, how did this mess come down for you anyway? This mess came down for me, I was a recruiter in Fort Worth. Mm-hmm. And one of the people I recruited, Sheldon Ward, I told him just before he went off to basic training, you know, that uh, if he ever needed me to look me up, you know, and uh, a little bit, a little bit later, after he got back from AIT, which is your training, you know, for the military, your job, and he came home, and I guess it was a few months after that, he uh, he came over to my house, him and his brother, and said, "Hey, we're getting ready to get evicted." Can I uh, bunk at your house until we save up some money to get a new apartment? Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, that's how that's how it started. Was there something special about him? I mean, if you're a recruiter, you dealt with a lot of people. Yes, I did. Yes, something. Yes, because uh, his family was all up in Kansas. You know what I mean? And um, he was young. You know, and I remember I left home when I was 17, joined the army, didn't didn't have anybody in my family. You know, following behind me. You know, and so when I met him, you know, and he came to me for help, you know, there's no way I was going to say no. One, that's how I was raised, and two, you know, if you, if you can't open open yourself, you know, and uh, help somebody else out, you know, then something's missing. And there was something about the military camaraderie and all. Well, that of too. course, you know, I, I put him in, you know, and he went, he ended up going into the reserves instead of the active army, you know. So uh, when he came back home, you know, he went to his reserve unit, and. Uh, it was over a year later is when him, him and his brother came and talked. So he to was me. bunked up at your house? Yes. What happened? Well, him and I lived in several different places. He would first, we first we lived, you know, in my, in my apartment. Then we moved, ended up moving in with this lady that had a big house, okay? And uh, he, had, he had moved out. You still recruiting or are you? Yes. Okay. Yes. And... Uh, me and Sheldon Ward had two separate lives. You know, all, all, you know, the state would have you believe that, you know, I knew everything that happened day in, day in and day out from Sheldon Ward. That's just not true. He had the people he ran with, and I had my job. You know, my job kept me busy from 5 in the morning to 10 at night, you know, six and a half days a week, you know. And uh, Sheldon Ward uh, had his job, and, and he had his friends, you know. And uh, in the afternoon, if I get off, if I got off work early, 
you know, I, let's go play some pool. You know, he didn't have he didn't have no money. You know, he, the place he worked at, he didn't make a lot of money. You know, and then again, you know, I I wanted to, I wanted to be you know there for somebody that, that didn't have anything. You know, so we went and played pool several times a week. You know, uh, and uh, I knew that he was getting into drugs. You know, and he he had been into drugs for a while, and uh, and he kept telling me that. Uh, he uh, he's upset, you know, because his his girlfriend and her mom took off with his his daughter, you know, and uh, he he told me one day that um, you know, he he wanted to feel what it was like to kill somebody. Really? I said, dude, what do you want to do that for? You can't come back after doing something like that, you know, because I've had I've had friends and I've had. Uh, you know, people that I've known throughout my life, you know, that they can sit there and attest that, you know, that you know, it, it just changes a person when you do, when you sit there and take another man's or person's life, you know. And um, he, uh, he came to me one afternoon, you know, and, uh, and told me this, and I said, man, that's, 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 that's messed up, you know. And then uh, the next thing I knew, 29 to all officers at all stations. It's now count time. It's now count time. Count time. That's all right. You don't have to go right. anywhere. And um, <laughs> I really, he told me, he, he called me. I was at Fort Hood. I went down there because I was doing the out processing. I was getting ready to get mm -hmm. out of the Army, you know, for, for ETS. And, and he told me that he had gotten these first. And I said, dude, what are you talking about? You know? We didn't, we didn't talk, talk about it much then. Then he came back. I got back to... He was still in the military. Yes, he was. And I got back to Fort Worth. And uh, he'd showed me some little... Uh, uh, little article in the paper, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, to tell you the truth, I didn't believe him. You know, because I, I, I've been a recruiter, you know, and heard things come out of kids' mouths, you know, you know, for the last couple of years, and there's no, I, I just take it with a grain of salt and go on in one ear and out the other, you know. But then uh, a few months later, when I, you know, I got out on February the first, and I started remodeling houses. Okay. I come, I come in from a day as working, and I got cops okay. surrounding me from every direction, and I found out that uh, they had. Warrants, you know, for you know, looking to look at the hotel room, look in my truck, and take DNA. You know, I said fine. You know, so they came in there and uh, told me to sit in the corner, face the corner. You know, uh, while they uh, looked through the room. You know, I said okay. And finally, they said well, we would like to come downtown. I said okay, that's fine. Who was the victim in this case? Uh, Mary Paul. Did you know her? No, I really, I didn't know her. You know, I, I it was a friend of, of Sheldon's. Mm -hmm. I'd seen her a few times, and we had never, we never, uh, you know, uh, never talked. I didn't know who she was really. You know, from, you know, besides from high here and there, you know, but uh, I didn't know her. He spent a lot of time high. Well, after he had his his child, after him and his girlfriend had a baby, you know, he he. I ain't gonna say he quit doing drugs, you know, but what he, he, uh, he went out and got a job, got a place to stay, you know. But he, he did continue to do drugs, you know what I mean? But now, but it continually got worse later, you know, uh, once, once his daughter got taken away from him, you know, so. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know, I just, it's just like he just didn't care no more, you know, so I don't know. Uh, how did the state get you involved in this case? The state got me, I'm here under the law of parties, you know. They know I didn't kill nobody. Matter of fact, in Sheldon Ward's trial, the same prosecutor, same judge said in his, in his case, there is nothing that says Mr. Foster had anything to do with this. And that's the only thing, truth. That I was think, in his trial? Yes. Said so, something different than your trial. Well, they didn't say that, uh, I had done it, you know. They did say, "Oh yeah, he he, he had to have known." You know, their roommates, they they, 
You know, they go to the pool hall three or four times a week, you know, trying to make it sound as if every time I took my shoes off, he knew which foot came yeah. off first, you know, and that's just not so, yeah. you know. So when the detective asked me you know, um, to give them a statement against Sheldon Ward, I said, I can't give you a statement. I wasn't there, I don't know. I don't know what on. And they interviewed for me, interviewed me for about three hours. And then uh, finally, I told him, look, either arrest me or send me home. Yeah, or do something or get off the pot. Right, you know. And uh, so they took me, had somebody take me back over to my room. You know, about 30, 40 minutes later, Sheldon Ward, he shows up. And I said, man, what's going on? You know, and you know, when he lowered his head and, and said, man, I effed up, you know. I said, oh man, you know, I, I just, I, I, I just sat there and went through. But that's really the first indication you were absolutely aware that something had happened. Right, because I didn't want to believe it. I mean, I mean, it's like, a, it's like a nightmare. It's been a nightmare for, you know, you know 3,779 days, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And uh, it, it, I don't know how to stop it because it seems like every, everything I do, you know, it, it's like beating your head against. So me. literally, under Texas so-called law of parties, right? You don't fit the pattern in that you did not know about any illegal activity going on at the time it actually went on. Now, as far as drugs, I knew he was doing drugs. He knew he was doing drugs. I knew he was doing drugs, but I had no but idea. But you ain't here for somebody doing drugs. Right. He, you know, I didn't had no idea he had, had committed a crime like this. You know. Now, after he had committed this serious crime, did you do anything to help him evade, escape? Or? No. No, I did not. I, matter of fact, I told him in the room, I said, dude, where are you going to go? this is in custody. No, no, no. They, I had told them, arrest me or send me back home. Yeah. We was at the hotel room. Yeah. And, and then uh, he shows up. He, then he shows up and he said, man, I effed up, you know. I said, oh, dude, dude, I don't want to know. I laid down on the, on, on, on the bed and said, I couldn't believe what I just heard. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so he starts packing up all his stuff, you know. I said, dude, where are you going to go, you know? I said, you can't go any, anywhere. If you anybody you know, they're going to get you, you know. I said, so. One, I wanted to know where he was going to go for a couple of reasons. One, you know, so I would know. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then, uh, well, so I would know, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I don't know. I, I, sometimes it's hard to explain sometimes, you know, because everything happens so well, fast. Well, actually, 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 and it's been a spell. It's yeah, been it's been time. a little over 10 years. It's been over 10 years ago, and during that period of time, you, those 10 years, you have experienced a good bit of duress. <laughs> yeah. Is this ain't the most yeah, nice just, place to live? Just just being here, yeah. It, it's it's it, it's a day by day yeah. ordeal, you know. So it's hard to uh, it's, uh, sometimes it's hard to stay on track, and, and unless you got a, a a good support group. You were, you were you were confident. Yes. That if the court discovers the truth. Yes. Your life's going to change for the better quickly. I knew. So, I mean. If the Supreme Court or even the Fifth Circuit could see all the stuff, everything, not just what they can are allowed to look at, if they was because by the time by the time it gets to them, if it if it if it is barred for anything at the state level, they know nothing about it, you know. So they're actually making rules or ruling, you know, on a case that uh, involves a lot more than what they're looking at, you know. So. Um, yeah, it, they look at it in strips. Right. And the strips are not necessarily, doesn't give you any idea about the overall. Right. How do you hold Sarge together? Well, I believe in God. And my mom always taught me never give up. It's like I was telling you before, I got a picture right beside my door on the inside of my cell. It's a picture of me in uniform, and I got, and, and it's a picture of my little son right there in the, up in the corner. And I look at that every day, and I said, you know what? I will fight this thing until hell freezes over. I did not do this crime. And sometimes it's, it's hard, you know, because not only are we sitting there fighting and trying to get people to believe you, but once you've been found guilty, it's, it's, it's hell trying to get people, 
even to pay attention to you. And then, then you come to a place like this when, where the majority of the people here do not give a dog about anybody here. And it seems, it seems like anything they can do to make your day longer or harder, they will do it. You know, so I look at that picture and I look at my son, he's smiling at me, he's got his little baseball cap on. And uh, that keeps me going. And then just uh, in February, <laughs> I had my first grandson. Mercy. And uh, I got a picture of him right, right above my bed, you know, the head of my bed, you know, my bunk. And uh, I look at his little smile on face every day. So, you know, it's, so time does continue to go on, you know, and so does my fight. And I would continue. You're fighting Sarge Foster's private war. Say it again? You're fighting yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sarge I mean, Foster's private exactly. war. Exactly. You know, I do. But it's against the country you volunteered to serve. You know, this is a big country. And when I, you volunteered to serve, they didn't tell you you were going to be a recruiter. They no. could have gone and seen combat. Right. I, uh, I had no idea that uh, things like this even happened. You know, even, even when I was a recruiter in Fort Worth, some of the places I was allowed to go into while I was in uniform to do, you know, background searches on sure. people, you know, and then later, you know, walking by those same doors, we're going one more door down, you know, you know, wearing red, you know, or, or white, you know, or green, whatever color jumpsuit they decide to put you in, yeah. you know. And it's like when you, and, and you ask them and say, hey, you know, listen to what I have to say. Look at this. Nothing, nothing you say does any good. You know, it's like whenever, whenever we get a reply to any of our habeas corpses, the only, re only response they come back with is, this don't prove your innocence. And I said, hold on a minute. I'm here on law of parties. You know I did not do this crime. So what are you telling me this does not prove my innocence? I should only be, have to prove what you people say I did. You say I knew about this, and I didn't know about it. And, and the experts and the photographs and, the, and, and witnesses, everything I've gotten since then, you know, you know, let me back up a second. The prosecution in my trial said, Your Honor, when you, when you don't have no evidence, you must work on building blocks. Well, hell, back where I come from, you didn't have no evidence. You didn't well, have no case. Maybe it didn't happen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But nevertheless. The burden of proof is always got, with the state, even now. Right. Even with you sitting over there in white, the burden of proof is on the state. Right. And they keep telling you, prove your innocence, mm -hmm. when in fact, it is their burden to prove your guilt, and that has not, in your mind, been done. Exactly. You know, I mean, every t every time we reply, you know, and they say that they're not prove your innocence, that that really upsets me. You know, because here, be I'm here under law of parties. I didn't kill nobody. Your own prosecution says, even says on record. We're waiting on the floor. I, you know, nothing says. The floor even the judge herself in. said, I don't see anything here that connects this man with this crime. And so I asked my attorney then, I said, why ain't she stopping this trial? Because she said, it had been, he, he told me it had been detrimental to her political career. And that's the kind of people that's being voted into office out there, and it's bull. And this is a Tarrant County? Yes, it is. Sarge Foster, I want to thank you for the interview. We have your permission to use this. Yes, you do. And so uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, we will go back on the radio to the, prison sh to the execution watch show. And you and I are going to continue to talk here. That'll work. That was my conversation with Sarge Foster in July. It was the last time I saw him. And uh, my name is Ray Hill, and I am kind of the host of uh, Execution Watch, not a pleasant duty. And I'm surrounded by a bunch of lawyers. Um, uh, uh, and uh, my question to uh, them is, that was kind of Sarge's closing arguments. Any comments? Larry, I, th I think Larry and I talked about this earlier. The thing that got Sarge in trouble from the trial viewpoint was what Larry's going to talk about is, according to the trial itself, he told a whole bunch of different stories and Ward told a whole bunch of different stories. That's basically what her, plus he denied having sex with this woman in his but sperm, his DNA proved that her sperm is in her vagina. And I think Larry's prepared to talk about the inconsistent stories, and I'm going to add some more stuff when Larry finishes. It actually, um, what Sarge mentioned, that the prosecutor built a case against him. 
the prosecutor's position was that um, they were going after Sarge because the, the claim was that the prosecutor said, I knew that he was guilty because he didn't offer a credible explanation. Um, and he, then he lied and gave contradictory stories about the sexual activity with Paul. The fact is you don't have to give an explanation at all. The the defense has the absolute right not to give shut any. Shut up. And, and, and that's, that's really the, the whole point is to shut up. Sarge, unfortunately, talked, and he talked a lot. And the more you talk, the more likely it is you're going to give inconsistent statements. And so what they did was they used his inconsistent statements and flat lies is what they could characterize him. We, we said say the inconsistent statements, but when you get to trial, that they're lies. Yeah. So if you tell us one story, then tell another story, then tell another story, then, then, then what happens is the, the prosecutor characterizes them as lies. Now, Sarge talked about the law of parties. Uh, but even the law of parties, it does require that the a person in Sarge's position actually do something. We, we, we explain the law of parties in that you know, if two people go together to rob, rob a liquor store, let's say. And somebody gets killed, and then somebody the law gets of the killed. parties. E- even the guy on, on the outside who's a getaway driver and didn't shoot anybody. But at least he's on the outside. They see him there. There's got to be some corroborating evidence. There's nothing to corroborate what Ward said in terms of Sarge except the prosecutor constructed that Sarge's inconsistent statements, his contradictory statements. So saying, basi- basically instance, they use Sarge's uh, uh, explanations against him because they didn't match up. Exactly. I mean, they, they were saying things like, for instance, he said that, that Paul had never been in the truck. Well, then maybe she was in the truck. Maybe she leaned into the truck. Well, where was his lawyer? Well, I'm not really sure. Because, see, the building blocks go like this. It's real simple. In order to make this a capital murder case, they had to prove that it was a murder committed during the course of rape or kidnapping. And that testimony came in when the, they called Dwayne Thomas to testify. He's the one that picked up Ward. Yeah. And he claimed that Ward told him that he pulled a gun on this lady and he raped her and abducted her and then killed her. And that's where the aggravated part. Now, they had to tie Sarge into that. And the only way they did it is extremely tenuous, is doing what Larry said, that he told a bunch of inconsistent statements. Namely, he didn't have sex. The DNA proved otherwise. Said she's in the truck, wasn't in the truck. Told some different stories about that. And then, here's what's really bizarre. I think it's even more bizarre. The way they tried Sarge into it was a supposition made by the investigating officer. When they found the body out in the woods, uh, she was shot in the head with a forty caliber gun, and normally that would leave some brain matter and leave a lot of blood. Yeah. And they claimed there was no brain matter there. There was not a blood, lot of blood there. Therefore, the investigators surmised that she was shot somewhere else and then taken to the woods and dumped. And here's what they said, that Ward is a small guy weighing 140 pounds. The Mary weighed 130 pounds. He couldn't have carried her by herself. There's no evidence she was dragged because there were no marks in the grass. So someone they claimed carried her. And therefore, they said Sarge had to be the one that helped carry the body because he was big enough to help tote her out there. So what they did, they built the supposition out of the evidence at the crime scene that since there was no brain matter there. that But all a, that's inference. Of course it's exactly. inference. That's the whole point. That's the building blocks we're talking about. And the way they tried to tar- tie Sargent on the law of parties is the investigator claiming that the woman was shot elsewhere. He is supposed, thought that, and that uh, so two people had to carry her out to the woods because she wasn't drug out there. And that's all just wild, wild speculation. speculation. Absolutely. Let me get Glory on see if something's happened in Huntsville. Glory, are you there? Oh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. What's happening? Well, I'm, I'm standing here with a uh, half dozen or more people with these beautiful turquoise T-shirts on that say Team Sarge. And I'm looking at Sarge's little grandson, who's not even a year old yet. How old is Seven months old. There's a sign that says, don't kill my grandpa. And we've been listening to Sarge, actually. I put it on the microphone. Good. But um, I've got his uh, daughter-in-law and what's Delisa? Uh, oh, that's his sister? 
Oh, okay. Anyway, if, if you would like to talk to some of the family. Well, I'd, I'd like to hear from them briefly. Any action about coming out? No, of- no, nobody's come out yet. So the only action is, is us out here protesting. Well, maybe maybe they're in a better frame of mind to talk about now than later. So why don't you pull them over? Yeah. And, you know, we talked to Sarge up until 5 o'clock, and he was, like always, positive and laughing and just had a good outlook, even as he's telling everybody. Well, he didn't say goodbye. <laughs> but and then somebody said they'd see him in heaven and somebody's going to kick his ass. I don't know. Oh, whoops, I can't say that. Um, yeah, you heaven. can say that. You can get away with that. Just but, did. Just did. Um, but anyway, okay, let me let me put on uh, Delisa just one moment. Hi, Ray. Hi, Delisa. Good to hear from you. Good, good to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, a sad occasion for me. Uh, I've been starred since 2000. And uh, as a, a Texan, I'm very ashamed at this point that we let this good man be killed under something like the law of the party. Uh, he was a good man. I've not known better in my life except for my dad. And I know most ladies will say that, but it's true. Uh, Well, I want you to be sure and give our sympathy to those gathered. I am not going to hang up this phone. I'm going to put it on hold. Okay. uh, uh, And uh, Mm. tell Gloria as soon as anything happens that we need to know about to contact us. Certainly. Thank you, darling. Appreciate it. Thank you. You know... See, those folks are going through some of the same things I'm going through. Here's this great big old plug ugly army looking guy. Right. And and he and I sitting there talking about um uh this doing this interview and I'm thinking this is his closing argument. And we it's not an interview because I mean I'm not cross examining him, so obviously I left out a lot of stuff that could have been covered, but it wouldn't have made any difference anyway because this is media and the rest of the world lives on a reality basis and not a media base. Ray, one thing I want to mention, I think Susan's going to address this. This was really an uphill battle for the state. It was a wild guess of being, getting found guilty, not guilty. In fact, I'm reminded what a lawyer once told a jury. You guessed him guilty, now guess how much punishment he should get. And they really guessed this guy guilty, but... After they found him guilty, when they went to punishment, it was just the opposite because there was a ton of evidence that really, really hurt Sarge, and Susan's the one that's going to talk. I said, prepared to talk about that. Well, I was also going to ask you, Ray, because you interviewed Sarge, so you, and you spent some time, a fair yeah, amount of time. You heard the whole thing, with, except we right. did this twice. And sure. so, so you spent a little time with them. And I guess I was going to talk about the Texas Tech, the graduate, and I was going to ask you what you thought of the relationship between Sarge and Ward. If you thought Sarge saw Ward as like a younger brother or like a son, or that Sarge, you know, perhaps didn't see, uh, was it possible that Sarge could have spent so much time with Ward and not picked up that there was probably something very wrong with Ward. I don't know that Sarge would be that analytical. I mean, because I, I've analyzed my own experience here and relived it a couple of times in thinking about it. Because, Sarge was a recruiter. He took kids off the street. You know, you get them in and you say, hoorah, hoorah, America's great. And you're going to go out and defend America from all of the problems. That, well, and, and, and so that kind of thing, he brought him in. That did not work out real well with Ward. Ward went not into the Army, but into the reserves. Now, that didn't keep him from serving in the military. But it did not, he did not serve handsomely. Then he shows up on Sarge's door. Sarge is an older guy. He's a kid. He's a fellow soldier. There's a camaraderie thing. And I don't know that I can explain this outside of the male bonding rituals that go on. But Sarge was quasi-parenting. See, one of the things that you have to wonder, okay, you know, it's probably reasonable. There's really no evidence that Mary Paul was raped. It appears there was consensual sex, okay? It, clearly she was shot. There's no evidence really that she was kidnapped other than 
Ward's statement, okay? But there's this also— Which was actually hearsay but to the court. But, was that— That would be hearsay. Now, now but it's an admission against thing the that interest, comes so out, it comes out in punishment, but this is kind of like why I was asking you the question of what you thought the relationship between Ward and Sarge was— is apparently there? There's another student. There was a recent graduate of Texas Tech. Sarge told the police that he and Ward met this young woman in the parking lot of her apartment complex. That they went to her apartment. One version of the story is that they met her in the parking lot for the first time. Went to her apartment. She declined to have sex with both of them. That they left. And that later, that that Ward went back into the apartment. Another version of the story that came out at punishment is that Sarge, that, that, that there was a statement from Sarge to the police that was admitted at punishment that, once again, that both men met this woman in the parking lot of her apartment complex, that they went to her apartment, that they had sex with her, and they left... And Ward went back, okay? And killed her. And killed her. Okay. And, Ward and, himself. And that, no. in the interview, that turns out to be somebody with a newspaper clipping. Yeah, but in mm -mm. his statement is entirely different, right? Right, yeah. right. Also, the, the, Ward had told a, another, shall we say, account, is that Sarge said that Ward told him after they had gone to the apartment, after they left the woman in the apartment— that Ward showed Sarge a newspaper clipping that the woman whose apartment they had just been in was shot in the head that night. Now, if Sarge had nothing to do with it, you know, wouldn't that cause a lot of him to have a lot of suspicion about Ward? If they had both been to the woman's apartment and then left, and whether they had sex with her or they didn't, but she, it, well, see, you're, you're trying to match up two totally different stories. And I don't know if Sarge could do that. Because I, mean, I, I think Sarge, Sarge, in his conversation with me, mm -hmm. uh, was about Sarge and the Damocles sword pending over his head. Okay. Uh, that's what our conversation was about. And so it wasn't a cross-examination about facts of the case. And, and so it appears in our conversation to be a newspaper clipping. Now, that that does not jibe with the story of we went together to the department, we had sex, or we went together to the department, we didn't have sex. Those are entirely separate mental frame stories that Sarge is talking about. Am I, am I way off base here? Now, see what happened. And when all that came in at punishment, what basically the jury heard was that these two guys had had sex with another woman and killed her. And then what really hurt Sarge is the state called a psychiatrist, and he, and what was really funny, not funny, I mean funny in the sense of being laughable, but what was really strange about this case, everybody who testified in Sarge's behalf were just like we said. Gloria is back. We okay. may have something going on here. Gloria, you're on the air. What can I do for you? Uh, Ray? Yeah. Sarge's family... Uh, it's coming out of the dead house, and the execution is over. Okay, Gloria, um, we're down to the last few minutes of the show. This is taking an awful long time for this process to complete. I know you assure me that it's all a matter of downers and they feel no pain. I am not convinced of that at all. Uh, well, I, I love you and trust you, but I'm just not convinced of that. And this has been especially horrible uh, on all of us because it was Sarge. Right, absolutely. And even the attorneys in the room are having difficulty getting oh, yeah. to any justification for this execution. A and so thank you very much for calling. Okay, but and you know, it was nice to hear Sarge's voice as they were killing him. <sighs> well, I don't know if nice is the right word. I think it's necessary for us to experience that to get to the gruesome nature of what this state is doing. Right. Thank you, Gloria. Okay. So Gloria's obviously emotional, and she gets emotional sometimes in these things. You would think that a hardened old activist like Gloria just would be a hard nut to crack, but 
she shatters because she and Sarge have been friends for a long time. I've listened for several years when she would come on the prison show and talk about other death penalty movements. It was always that, Sarge, we're pulling for you. Good luck. Sarge, take care of yourself. Sarge had to go through four separate scheduled executions prior to tonight. Some of the stays came earlier. One of them, we were in the middle of a show when it came. Right. And so uh, 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 that in and of itself is torturous. And we're unable to hear with all of the brains I've got sitting around this table. Now, I'm the, I'm the dumbest guy here. We're unable to put together this puzzle so that it fits with any degree of certainty, are we? You're absolutely right. The guilt or innocence part, I mean, is really questionable. But as I was going to say earlier, what really hurt him at punishment was the testimony that he was also involved in war with the death of another woman, very similar to the death of this one, sex and killed afterwards. Then the state called a psychiatrist, and this really hurt him. Testified he was sociopathic, narcissistic, and had all the makings of being a serial killer. And then you add that at punishment where they find out that Ward and Sarge were involved with the death of another woman, although Sarge claims that Ward did the killing. He does admit that, or claim that at least in one of the statements, he had sex with the woman before she was killed. In this case, there's no doubt that he had sex with Mary because the DNA proved that. And she's killed. And then you add that to a psychiatrist saying it's a serial killer, that equals a death penalty. But the real right question, the serious, serious question, everyone at this table is going to have, there is not enough evidence to tie him in to doing something to aid or assist the murder of this woman. Because there's nothing to prove she was kidnapped, nothing to prove that she was raped, and nothing to prove that he had anything to do with it, period. Larry, is that your reading? Yes, because so much of, of what they presented to the jury was just inferential and circumstantial. For instance, Jim was talking about that Mary was taken by two people to the site where the body was dumped, which nobody knows whether that happened or not. And there was some evidence about her arm being up in the air, meaning that one person had to hold her arms, another person had to hold her legs, which was a stretch. But then they say, well, since Sarge and Ward were inseparable, then it must have been. It Sarge. must have been, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 it's so it's, it's that a bunch kind of, of suppositions, and, and absolutely. Uh, absolutely, the state is flying on hope and a prayer, and it worked. And even the statements themselves, because just what you because you say something does not mean it's going to be accurately recorded. So, so what you if you start talking, then especially if you've been there for three hours, four hours, seven hours, or so forth, you say different things. And the best thing, the best advice is just, I need a lawyer. I need to talk to a lawyer, and that that stops it. But people, especially people who have who think they haven't done anything wrong, tend to talk a lot. Susan, you're chomping at the microphone. Well, okay. The woman, Mary Powell. I mean, the bartender testified clearly. The evidence was that she was friendly with Ward. That they were, shall we say, quite cozy at the bar. That she left voluntarily. The dirty dancing stuff. Right. There's, you know, no evidence she was abducted, kidnapped, or raped although we know she was clearly killed. All right, the other woman, the Texas Tech graduate, and, and I think this is really where, where, let's just say, the combination of everything, I think, shall we say, puts Sarge where he is. The Texas Tech graduate, it's a, it's a, very, it's a different story in that this woman, okay, Sarge himself tells the police that they met this young woman in a parking lot. So this young woman was a recent graduate of Texas Tech. She graduated magna cum laude. She was active in the Baptist church with a Baptist mission. She spent a lot of her time on vacation and off participating in these missions. She um, had a boyfriend that lived at the same complex. This is the complex where they met her in the park. She had a boyfriend that lived there. She was apparently walking over to do the laundry. And she's also engaged to him, Susan. Right. Okay. And she was actually checking to see if her boyfriend's roommate needed to have any laundry done. So it it seems to really, I don't think anyone's going to believe that this young woman meets two guys in a parking lot and that this woman 
shall we say, invites them up to her apartment for any reason, to have sex or to not have sex, okay? And Sarge, you know, whether one version is they had sex, sex with her, they left. The other version is she refused to have sex with them, they left. Although, and all of that in my it, interview it, it, it is doesn't, condensed to a newspaper article. Right. But but clipping. no no the newspaper in, clipping. Let's let's in Sarge's statement, what he's saying, what he tells the police is after they left that he was with Ward. That Ward later showed him a newspaper clipping about this woman's death. That's the, okay. the Texas Tech student. Okay. And I, I think I, that I, story I, I, is, is a uh, the, problem. The most unfortunate thing about radio yeah. is that the clock is God. And uh, the clock has just run out on this. It's uh, kind of a metaphor of the clock has run out on Cleve Foster tonight. Cleve Foster is dead. He was alive when we began this show. I want to thank all of my staff. I want to thank Doyle for in there laboring over the electronics thing. I want to thank Mike for being in there to um, answer Doyle's needs. Uh, uh, the next scheduled execution is of Jonathan Green, and that is scheduled for October the 10th. Uh, execution Watch only plays when someone is being executed. I want to thank Gloria Ruback for her coverage, uh, her connection with the abolitionmovement.org. I want to thank Nancy Bailey for her coverage uh, and her association with Texas uh, Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. I want to thank Jim Skelton, Susan Ashley, Larry Douglas, and of course our masterful uh, uh, producer, Elizabeth Stein, who's not here tonight but anguish many hours in making this work. This is Ray Hill for radio station KPFT Houston. Good night. Wow. Thank you. Sorry about cutting short. She's God right there. She tells you know, me what to do. Ray, I tell you what, I think if it's possible, I think that the real compelling thing is you could do yeah. An interview, I think the thing that would really keep this program on an interview and see actually hearing the voice of the man who's extended to the executive. If we could in interview everybody prior to this, I'm having to say something, I think it'd be extremely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's gonna, that's going to take more than an hour. Well, I know that.